Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have your Bibles with you, please open it with me. In the book of Psalms, chapter 11, verse 4. It says here, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is, in his, in, is on His heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. Please kneel. For our thoughts on Sabbath, I'll be reading from the book of Child Guidance, page 529. God has given us the whole six days in which to do our work and has reserved only one to Himself. This should be a day of blessing to us, a day when we should lay aside all our secular matters and center our thoughts upon God and heaven. God requires not only that we refrain from physical labor upon the Sabbath, but that the mind be disciple to dwell upon sacred themes. All who love God should do what they can to make the Sabbath a delight, holy and honorable. Please stand. We love thy Our Heavenly Father, we want to express our gratitude to you for the privilege that we have to gather together to worship you in freedom. Thank you because we can come after a week of activities to render our tributes, our gratitude, to express our needs also before your throne. We invite you to be with us, leading us in every part of this uh, special service today because we need you and we want to be sure that the presence of the Holy Spirit is going to be leading us in every part of this worship service rendered to you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may now be seated. For our Sabbath expression of praise, we will be singing two songs. 
Wake the song and holy thine. For our first song, let's sing Wake the Song.
but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distress, in stripes, in prisons, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love and faith, by the word of truth, by the power of God. We would like to thank you for this week of spiritual emphasis that despite of our hectic schedules, we have come to know and grow in the knowledge of knowing you as our God who called us in the ministry. We are sorry, dear Lord, for we are constant recipients of your mercies, and yet how little gratitude we express, how little we praise you for what you have done for us. As we come to worship you in spirit and in, and in of truth, we pray for our speaker, Pastor Ricardo Gonzalez, as he speaks eternal truth. Be with him, speak with him, so that you and you alone will be glorified. I also pray for the congregation to please in tune our hearts and our minds so that nothing can hinder us to receive you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that even before we utter a word, you already hear us. Forgive us for our trespasses and all of our shortcoming. This all we ask in the loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
عمرنا لما كنا قوانا
this morning, we praise and thank the Lord for His goodness for sending in our midst His messenger in the person of Dr. Pastor Ricardo Gonzalez. And I think he can relate very well with your experience because he has been a pastor for 30 years now, almost 30 years now, or even more than 30 years. And he actually is serving us today and we are glad to welcome also in our midst his partner in the ministry. Sister Neri Gonzalez, please, would you mind standing? Welcome. We are glad to see you because though this is a special worship service intended and prepared by the College of Theology students, we have also here in our midst, perhaps, future ministers' wives. Or, we do not know, perhaps some of them. Amen. I said that uh, he, he could relate very well with you because he worked as dean of the men's dormitory. Also, he worked as a pastor in the field. And he also served in the capacity of ministerial secretary. And yes, he also became university president. And so it's a well-rounded ministry. And two years ago, Yes, he was called to serve here in the Philippines in Adventist International, International Institute for, of Advanced Studies, or we call it IAS. We have been together in the seminary sometime when the two of us both were taking our uh, postgraduate degree in theology. I think he is in the line of systematic. Systematic while I work in my applied theology postgraduate degree. And so, future ministers and future ministers' wives. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to listen to the messenger of God this morning. Ayas Seminary Dean, Dr. Pastor Ricardo Gonzalez. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's nice to be here. I have to say thank you for the invitation to those who contacted me through our pastor there. And uh, it's a, really a privilege for me to be here. I have to say this and thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Amurao. He's true, I mean, we were together at the seminary at the time when I was already writing my dissertation, I think Dr. Amurao came. He came to complete also his PhD. And you know, it's, it's a privilege to serve the Lord and to work for the church because we have no idea where we would meet tomorrow. We have no idea what the Lord will demand you know, from us, what the Lord has in his plans for each one of us, we have no idea. We have just to be faithful to him. Because at the time when I came to the Philippines, I am talking about, uh, well, more, several years ago, I, I think we came with my wife and two children in, at the beginning of 2003. And uh, I came to the Philippines to get my PhD, 
And as uh, Dr. Amurao said, you know, I went through my tra doctoral training in uh, historical si systematic theology. I wrote my dissertation on LNGY ecclesiology. Then I, I've been teaching some uh, courses on Adventist history, LNGY writings, but also in systematic theology because my area was very much related to the doctrine of the church. But you know, uh, after I finished, I, we went back to our country with my family, my wife, my two children. I have to say, you have no idea how fast the time is going to pass for all of you. Do well what you are doing today because tomorrow is going to be late, you know. We have the day that we have today. And don't plan too much in the future. I mean, plan for the future, but don't live into the future. Live the present, okay? You cannot resolve what is in the past, and you cannot manage the future. You have just the present, okay? Dream about the future. Learn from the past, dream about the future, and be faithful in the present, okay? Be faithful, because your present would determine what is going to happen in your future. Your past, no way to change it, but the future, surely, surely, you can do it. But what happens in the future depends, depends at all in what you are doing now, today. Well, I'm saying this because our two children, as I said, they were here with us. My daughter, I think she was 13 years old when we came. My son was 11. And now time passed, you know, so fast. They are professionals. They are back in our country. And... Uh, they are there also with their own plans for life, and we see, you know, the ways how the Lord is uh, doing his work because we were invited to come back to the Philippines, and we said, well, Philippines is like, uh, it's like coming back home because we lived here already before about uh, six years here. And uh, when I see, you know, all of you, I see different faces here. I believe that not all of you are from the Philippines. And I was asking Dr. Amurao how many countries you have represented in the School of Theology here. And he said, well, quite a number. Uh, you, you are from different places. I see that some of you are coming from uh, other countries here in Asia. Uh, maybe some of you are coming from uh, the States, and uh, some of you I can see are coming from uh, some countries in Africa. And you know, this is an international movement, and we have to learn how to deal with each other, and what a nice experience you are having here. You know, I, I value this very much, because at the time when I studied in my country, we were all Chileans, and I am sure some of you have no idea where Chile is. And uh, it's normal, it's normal, I mean, but now we have the internet and it's easier to learn about that. Uh, I'm saying it's normal because if somebody asks me about some places now in the world, now I would say it's, it's much easier with me, you know, to know because I am working in a very international institution and, and every time that we receive students, I know, I try to be well acquainted with the place that they are coming from. But uh, I have to say Chile is a small country, a very thin and long country in the border coast of South America. We are to, towards the Pacific. It's a very long country and not so big but uh, there you can find uh, the challenges that we are facing because the most secularized country in Latin America up to today is, is Chile. And uh, to preach the gospel in my country is so challenging as it is in yours, okay? Every country has its own challenges and difficulties. And then we say, how can we minister? How can we do a good, you know, work for the Lord in the circumstances in which the world today is so, is so difficult? I remember when uh, Ban Ki-moon, the former uh, 
United Nations secretary said, you know, the world is falling apart. Uh, well, there is nothing that we can do about that. And uh, when you see what is happening, when you see the news, uh, maybe you are also wondering, what are we supposed to do in a context like this? How can we uh, be effective in carrying forward the mission that the Lord has given us? And I have to confess, you know, we believe as Seventh-day Adventists that we belong to a movement that has a huge a huge responsibility towards the world. We understand that we are not like any other denomination. We believe that we are in the world because we have a mission. And that mission is to get the world ready for the second coming of Jesus. And tell me, is that an easy task? If you go to, you know, to knock any of the doors here in the vicinity, is the people really willing to listen about that? Is there people really willing to learn about that? And I have to say, the Philippines is a country that we can say is very special in one sense here in Asia. The Philippines, uh, I have to say this before I will mention what I want to say regarding the religious part of the country. But you know, this country was um, a Spanish colony for a number of years, about 350, I think. And you know, we are from uh, Latin American contacts, you know. Um, in South America, we also had the Spaniards living there for a number of years. When we came first to the Philippines, we discovered that the country here, even though it's placed here in Asia, has uh, many things, many things. You cannot imagine, you know, how much similar is this country to several Latino countries. And I understand this, why? Because you were under the rulership of Spaniards for a number of years too. The way how the cities are organized here, the way, the place that the church, the Catholic church, plays in the life of the country, the influence of the, of the church in the daily life of the people is like in any Latino country. And you know, when you live here in the Philippines, it's very interesting because you say, oh, I am here in Asia, but the Philippines is not like other ancient countries because in other ancient countries they have different kind of religions. But here, Christianism is very strong. And I would say now, going to my main idea, maybe here, you know, uh, the people also are more friendly when you want to talk about God. I mean, they, they fear, they want to know more. Not all, but in generally speaking, we say, well, we have an audience here who is willing to learn more about God. Uh, but you know what is happening today because of the way how the devil is working? More and more also the country is changing. And you see that people is becoming more and more, uh, how can I say, is strong in their uh, re rejection, I would say, or in their standing regarding their place or the place of religion in their lives. Well, we have to to witness in a world that is presenting many, many challenges today to the church. And uh, before going to my um, message regarding the week of prayer, what Paul's, well, the lesson that we can learn from the road to Damascus, let me say something to you all also. You have no idea, you have no idea where the Lord can guide you tomorrow 
in his service. I am talking here, if Jesus does not come yet, I believe that he's coming soon, but I have no idea when that is going to happen. You, you, all of you, or most of you, will be leading the church, serving the church. And here, among you, are the next generation of pastors in our churches. And I have to confess, I've been in different responsibilities in the church. The Lord gave me the privilege to serve as a local pastor, as Dr. Amurao said. I work as dean of, men, dean of men in one of the schools for four years, chaplain, a department director, and then I became an administrator too. But you know what? When I graduated from my master's degree, I got my diploma by email, or by mail, no email, by mail. One day I got my diploma, I studied my master's degree in Argentina, and once, you know, we were about the year, I believe, 2000, I got my degree from Argentina. When I finished my doctorate here, my PhD, I had to go back very soon because I had to teach in my school back in Chile. And I got my degree from IAS by hand because somebody who was traveling from here to South America, that person took my, dip my diploma with him. I got two diplomas regarding my studies by hand. I mean, somebody brought them to my place. But I have to tell you something. The only time when the church was with me all together and they were all, you know, congratulating me and they were very happy for what was happening to me was the time when I was ordained as a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our degrees are important. Yes, we need them. We need our degrees. But the most important part is when I was ordained as a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What I mean is there is nothing, nothing more important in the church than to serve as a minister. Can you imagine the confidence that the church may have in you in giving you a whole district and you can influence the minds of the children, the minds of the youth and to, to minister to the old people? Do you believe that you can take that for granted? Because you are nice, because you are kind, because you are well educated. That is the confidence of the church in somebody who was called to serve as a minister. And tell me, how can having this understanding of our high calling to be unfaithful? To do things as we believe that we have to do things. You know, oh, you know, we have meeting today. Ah, it's okay, I am not ready, but ah, let's go to the meeting. You know, those who are leading in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they have received from the church a huge and enormous privilege and responsibility. And, but some people, they say, you know, I don't want to become a pastor. My dream is to become a PhD. I want to be a professor. I would love to be a professor in AUP or Mountain View College or in Bacolo in our school or in any of our schools here or maybe in Thailand, Myanmar, in some places in Africa or wherever the Lord can guide you tomorrow. 
You can say, you know, I would love to do this and that. Or others may say, oh, you know, when I see the conference president here around, when I see the university president, or when I see the union president or the leaders from the division, some of you can think, I would love to be seated where they are. I would love to do what they are doing. You have no idea. You have no idea the burdens, the, the heavy loads that these leaders are carrying forward because of the needs of the church. What I am saying is, if you have to dream, make your dream be a good minister of the Lord, a good pastor, a, to be a blessing for the church where you might be called tomorrow because that is the highest privilege that we have. I have to confess, I've been already president. You know, I was appointed with the, the board, but then I received a different call, I had to move to a different place, and you know what happened? The leader, they say, Thank you very much, Pastor Gonzalez. All the best in the new place where you are going. And then come the new one. Welcome to the new one. In our church, the, the responsibilities that we have, they are all something that you can have today, but you can have tomorrow. You may not have it tomorrow. But there is something that will always be with you. And that is your calling, your ordination as a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It means that we all have to be faithful to that calling. To do well what the Lord expects from us. To be faithful to the responsibilities that we were given. If you read in the Bible, I want to, to say... You know, when I read in the uh, book of Acts, the experience of Paul in the road to Damascus, I say, you know, what a call, what a call. And allow me to, to share with you some of these ideas. Um, let's uh, open our Bibles in the book of Acts because I would like to share with you some thoughts that are based on Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 9. Let's have a word of prayer before we read the Bible now. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are ready to Open your word, and we trust, O oh Lord, that you will speak to our hearts, that the presence of the Holy Spirit will be impressing our lives, that we can be faithful to your call, that we can be faithful to the dreams, to the expectations that you have upon all of us. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit guiding our thoughts, as we analyze this passage today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read to all together uh, Acts chapter nine, verses one to nine, okay? I will read from the New King James Version. The Bible says, then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him 
He stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and with his eyes, on when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. If you study this passage in the context, you will see that this passage is the continuation of what happened in chapter 8. And now in chapter 8, you will see very interesting things about this uh, man, Paul. Let's see first uh, chapter 7, verse 58. The Bible says, is referring to the martyrdom of Stephen. The Bible says in verse 28, uh, 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses lay down their clothes at the feet of a young man, young man named Saul. Now chapter eight, verses one to three. When Saul was consenting by his death, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And the both men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. If you put all of these passages together, you have an idea of the person we are dealing with. We are talking about somebody who was really committed as a Jew to his own religion. This is a man who had strong convictions. He was young, but he was really committed to his cause. The Bible describes the role that Saul played in the death of Stephen and uses the term uh, suneudokeo. When the Bible says that he consented, that he approved what was happening to Stephen, the Greek word that appears there gives the idea of approval, but not a passive approval. It's the approval in which he was very much active in saying he has to die. He has to be killed. When the Bible uses the verse that he was part of this result in the life and the experience of Stephen, the Bible is saying that Saul was very much active. Okay? Don't just believe that he said, you know, he was observing what is happening there. I want to see what is happening with this uh, group of people. And he, since he was standing there, some say, you know, let's leave our clothing with this young man. No, 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 no. When you read in the Bible in the original, you will see that Paul or Saul at that time, he was very much part of the destiny of the fate of Stephen. He was very much active. Don't imagine that he was just observing them. And I am saying this because we are dealing here with somebody, when, somebody who was a kind of person that when he was sure about something, he will do whatever he could to succeed on that. And he was a really committed you. At the end, the Bible says, you know, that when uh, Stephen was killed, when he became a martyr, that he was really decided to eliminate Christian religion. If you see with uh, detention, if you read carefully the Bible, please, when you read the Bible, pay attention to the details. And I will show you one. I'm sure that you have been reading this passage for a, for a while, but I want to point to some details in this passage. N number, chapter number nine, if you see in verse two, he asked, 
letter from him, who is this? The high priest. He asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Observe the detail here. He asked, the Bible says, for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, or at Damascus. Why? Why letters for the synagogues? Why the synagogues are mentioned here related to the Christian church? This is a detail important, because at the beginning, Christianity started among Jews. Some of you can say, or you can imagine that Christianity went through different places, but not Jews. The first of those who were following of Jesus were mostly Jews. That's the reason because he says, I want to see in the synagogues who are those who are not real Jews. I want to see who are the traitors there. I want to see in that synagogue who are those who are professing and following this new way. Christianity and Judaism, at the beginning, they were very close because the first converts of the Christian church, they were coming from a Jewish background. Another thing that we have to take into consideration. He was decided to bring women and men. And this is very interesting. Nobody would escape from his hand. He will not be the kind of person that we say, you know, let's spare ladies here and let's deal with the men. He was committed. Women or men, they have to be brought to Jerusalem. Have you seen also the term that is used to refer to the Christian church? Way. And this is a very interesting detail, too. Because Paul said, I want to see who are those who are walking in this new path, in this new way. And he was committed to resolve that. But you know, the detail is, when he was in his own way, the Lord found him. He wanted to destroy those who were on this new religion called the way, but he, when he was in his own way, the Lord called him. This is very interesting. Observe the details. What the Bible says. You know, if you read the Bible in the book of Acts until chapter 9, you will see something totally different from, oh, from chapter 1 to 9, from cha chapter 10 ahead. Chapter 9 is a kind of uh, half. It's very interesting because from chapter 10 ahead, you will see that the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. But until before that, the gospel was preached mostly among uh, Jewish people. And here, Peter also played a very important role, you know? Peter and Cornelius, you know that experience too. These are the two cases that we can say, you know, uh, they were able to reach some people who were not from the Jewish community. Well, let's move on now to what happened uh, later. Somebody said that the conversion of soul is believed by some to be the most important event in the church since Pentecost. Luke certainly considers soul's conversion significant because if you see in the book of Acts, 
this is a question for all of you good theology students. Do you know how many times Saul's conversions is presented in the book of Acts? How many times? Three. This is very interesting. This is the only event in the book of Acts that you can, you can find in which the conversion of Saul is uh, pointed out. Chapter 9, chapter 22, and cha chapter 26. In these three chapters, you will find the conversion of Saul. Why? Why? Well, let me tell you, who was Luke, the writer of the gospel? Was he, was he a, a Jew or was he a Gentile? Who was Luke? The evangelist, the writer. He was a Gentile, he was a medical doctor, a well-instructed man, okay? A man who had cultivated his mind. And it's very interesting to observe that in writing about Paul, the apostle to the, apostle to the Gentiles, he recalls the incident of his conversion thrice. And as I said, chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26, in these three places, you can find the description of what happened to him in the way to Damascus. Well, he was going to Damascus. What do you know about Damascus? Damascus, I have to say, is a city that's still in place today. If you read the news, you will see that Damascus is a city that is in place today, and uh, you can observe that this city has at least 5,000 years of history. Can you imagine when you visit, if you had the privilege to visit some places in the world, it would be nice if you can be in those places who have so much ancient history. And Damascus is a city with about 5,000 years. And I have to say, during the first millennium before Jesus Christ, uh, at the time of King David, Solomon, Damascus was the capital of the kingdom of Aram. Well, in the road to that city, Jesus met him. Jesus encountered him and called him. I have to say something very interesting here also. In going to this city, Jesus decided to call to this man. And the Bible says, the Bible says that uh, as they journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If you see here, you will find three questions and I want to refer to them. The Bible does not say here that Jesus was talking to him. Did you see that? The Bible just said that he was surrounded by a powerful light. A light, chapter uh, 9, verse 3, a light shone around him from heaven. The Bible is not saying that he, that was Jesus Christ. But you know, Paul said later that this light was the resurrected Jesus. Because when he recalled this, if you read 1 Corinthians 9, 1, you will see that he refers that this light was the resurrected Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 1. Can somebody read this? If you have it, please, can you read this verse? Does somebody have it? Yes, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, yeah. Okay, you have, 
uh, done right, okay? That is the best. But can I ask you to read it again, but give expression to the questions? Okay, because you have questions here, yes? Please, read it again. Because he's saying here, this is what I saw. I saw him. The light that is described here is not saying that he saw Jesus, but later on, when he was writing to the church in, in, uh, to the Corinthians, he says, well, the one, that light was Jesus. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord, he says. Mrs. White, when she mentions about this, she says, Paul now saw that in the persecuting the followers of Jesus, he had in reality been doing the work of Satan. He saw that his convictions of right and of his own duty had been based literally on his implicit, implicit confidence in the priests and rulers. Now that Jesus himself stood revealed, Saul was convinced of the truthfulness of the claims made by the disciples. Mrs. Wise also confirms to us that uh, the light that he, you know, received from heaven was Jesus. You know, can you imagine at this time when uh, he fell down to the ground and then he heard a voice saying to him, why are you, why are you persecuting me? The Bible says that he had no idea who was talking to him. Because the question in verse 5 is, and he said, who are you, Lord? You know, if I have to say, why did Jesus call Paul or Saul? Why? I was reading some, you know, theologians and some resources, and I have to say that I found five reasons, or six reasons, I would say, why the Lord decided to call uh, Paul. I can show you, I will mention just the biblical text, and you will see that this is biblically based, okay? But some people believe that the reason why the Lord called Saul are these. Number one, God called him because he knew the Jewish culture and language very well. Is that true or false? What would you say, true or false? God, God called him because he knew the Jewish culture and language very well. And I can give you the text, you know, Acts 21:40 and Philippians 3.5. You will find there the verses that uh, respond to what I am saying. A second reason, because he was reared in Tarsus, he was well acquainted with the Greek culture and its philosophies. Because he was born and he learned at the beginning of his life in Tarsus, he was very well acquainted with Greek culture and its philosophies. Well, I can say in Acts chapter 17, 22 to 31, and Titus 1, 12, you can find that this is true. Also, number three, some say, you know, that uh, God called him because he possessed all the privileges of a Roman citizen. Is this true or not? He was a real Roman citizen. Number four, God called him because he was trained and skilled in Jewish theology. And this is true too. Number five, God called him because he was capable in a secular trade, he was able to support himself too. He was a self-support worker. If he was not hired by the church, 
he would be able to sustain himself. He was a very capable person. And lastly, God called him because he received from God seal, leadership qualities, and theological insight. And we can say all of these things are really true. Six reasons why God called Saul. He knew the Jewish cultural language. He was reared in Tarsus, and he was well acquainted with Greek culture and philosophies. He possessed all the privilege of a Roman citizen for. He was uh, trained and skilled in Jewish theology. Five, because he was capable in a secular trade and he was able to support himself. And six, God gave him seal, leadership qualities and theological insight. All of these, I can say, are they right? Yes, we are right. But let me tell you, I believe, I personally believe, that God called Saul because he would do whatever he could to be faithful to and to obey God's voice. I believe that these things are all important, but I believe that God decided to call him because the Lord knew that Saul would do whatever he could to accomplish God's will. Then my question is, what about you? Why are you here? Why you decided to study theology? What do you want to do in the future? Are you pursuing a good career? Let me tell you, to be a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a career. It's not a career. This is a call. Because in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, once you go to work in different congregations and dealing with different kind of people, sometimes you will wonder and you will ask yourself, why, why I decided to do this? Why these people are saying this about me? This is not true. And you will have to be very patient and to say, oh Lord, I am not here because I depend on what the people think on me. I am here because you called me. I am not here just to be the preferred man on campus. Because sometimes, because you know of the privilege that we have because we work for the church, we believe that we are specials. And this is very tempting. Let me tell you, we are broken vessels. We are not the treasure. Sometimes we walk as we are getting responsibilities. We are very much tempted to believe that we are specials. We are all specials, yes. Jesus died for us, for all of us. But to consider that I am better than you because of the responsibilities that the Lord has given to me. No. Then the question is again, why are you here? Why are you here? Why did you choose to study theology? What are your dreams for the future? If you are planning always to do whatever the Lord demands from you, you are right. You are in the right place. But if what you are trying to find is a way to have status, popularity, even some money, in the church you will never, you will never be a rich person. As the world, as the world considers richness, okay? But you will be the richest people on earth if you keep yourself faithful to your calling. Because for some people, they believe, you know, that uh, 
is easier. Ministering in the church is very easy. I have to say, every time is harder and harder. And only those who depend from the Lord, only those who walk in their own knees, they will succeed. You will never be greater than the time that you spend in your own needs. Your success is in your needs. It's not in what you are doing. Even though I, I'm sure you are very capable, you are a very intelligent student, and you have gift. But they all will be useful when you put them all before the altar of the Lord. The second question then is, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says in verse 5, I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. I am Jesus. I am the one you are looking for. But what are you doing? You will not succeed on this. And then we find the call to the ministry. And let me tell you at the end of my message some few reflections regarding this calling to the ministry. The first one, another detail. When you read the Bible, pay attention to the details. I want to show you another one. If you read in chapter 4, the Lord asks, why are you persecuting me? There is a very important detail there. The Lord says, why are you persecuting me? Why is this important? Because Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? It means that everything that he was doing to God's people, he was doing that against Jesus himself. And I have to point, you know, to this important uh, aspect also, because you have to remember always that uh, the church you are planning to serve is God's property. We have never uh, how can I say this? We should never think that the church, our church, the Christian church, is human, is a human intent. This is God's intent. It means that the church is not the idea of any human being. The church is the body of Jesus, and Jesus is the head of the church. What does it mean? It means that leaders of the church are not to be lords of the church, but servants of the church. The church belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the head. We are part of this body. It means that always in whatever we do, we have to think, what can I do to serve better the Lord? Also, we have to remember, unity of, the unity of the church is something that always has to be kept. There is no separation between the head and the body. Some people say, you know, I have a good relationship with Jesus. I am very much okay with Jesus. But with the church, I have some distance. How that could be? If you love Jesus, can you say that you don't love his church? Because in the Bible, there is no separation between the head and the body. And that's the reason why Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Paul was persecuting the Christians. Paul was trying to kill Christians. But Jesus said to him, you are persecuting me, sorry. You are not dealing with this person. And for that reason, when you are facing troubles, when you face that your money is not enough for you to study, when you feel that there is no way for you to get some of the things that you are being dreaming of, don't fear. The Lord says, you are my property. You belong to me. 
and nobody can touch you, at least as the Lord may allow that to happen. You are not alone. But you know, it's very easy for the devil to discourage us. Isn't it? It's very easy for him because sometimes we face troubles and we believe, I am alone. Who cares? Who cares? Who knows what I'm going through now? Who knows about, you know, my problem in my house? The challenge that I have, let's say, with my parents or with my brother or my sister or the challenges that we are having as a family or the problem that I'm facing with my wife. Who cares? Well, I have to tell you, if you belong to the, to the church of Jesus, if you belong to his people, somebody cares. And this is the evidence. When Paul was doing all of these things, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Because you belong to Jesus, you are not alone. You have to be sure and rest in the promise that the Lord will open the way for you, that the Lord will accomplish his purposes in you. Finally, Paul at the end said the third question. Verse 6, So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? When you have really met Jesus, this is the next question at the end. Lord, what do you want me to do? I have to say, you know, to end my message in this morning that I have other uh, ideas here, but allow me to just to end with a statement from Mrs. White in which he, she says, you know, the type of person that Paul became, this former soul, was converted, we became the Apostle Paul. In Gospel Workers, Mrs. White says, Paul carried with him the atmosphere of heaven. All who associated with him felt the influence of his union with Christ. The fact that his own life exemplified the truth he proclaimed gave convincing power to his preaching. Here lies the power of the truth. The unstudied, unconscious influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that we or that can be given in favor of Christianity. I will repeat this. Here lies the power of the truth. The unstudied, unconscious influences of the holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity. This persecutor, this former you, when he met Jesus, Mrs. White says, he carried with him the atmosphere of heaven. All who associated with him felt the influence of his union with Christ. Then I, I wondering, what about me? What about me? Then I question, what about you? Can those who are near to me say, he knows Jesus, he knows Jesus? Can those who are close to you say, he loves God, he knows Jesus very well, I can feel it. The Lord get, can meet you today. You, I'm sure, you have already had your own road to Damascus. Which stage are you now on? What of these three questions are yours? Maybe the three of them. Maybe some of you, the first one, who are you? 
for some of you, maybe the second one. Or the third one. What should I do? May the Lord keep us faithful. May the Lord bless you all. May the Lord help you to succeed in what you are doing and to be faithful to your calling. You have no idea again of the dreams, of the expectations that the Lord have, has on you. May the Lord fully accomplish his will in all of you today and for eternity. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. In behalf of the Young Ministers Club, officers and members in the College of Theology, we would like to present this token and certificate of appreciation to Pastor Ricardo Gonzalez. I would like to request Pastor to stand here in front and also Dr. Amaral. And also the uh, other faculties and staffs of the College of Theology, Pastor Fernando, we would like to request you in the front. Before we give this certificate of appreciation, I want to read the citation. It says here, Adventist University of the, the Philippines, Putinkao Silang Cavite, College of Theology presents this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Ricardo Gonzalez for selflessly sharing his support, time, knowledge, and expertise as guest speaker during the culmination of the week of prayer of the College of Theology with the theme, The Road to Damascus. Held at Finster Hall of All Nations given this 25th day of November 2017 at the College of Theology, AUP Campus, Patinkahoy, Silang Cavite, signed YMC President, Pastor for Evangelism, Pastor Ray Maglipas, Dean of the College of Theology, Dr. Julio C. Amorau, and the Vice President for Student Services, Dr. Winifredo C. Paez. point of time, we are now going to worship God through our tithes and offering. For our thoughts on stewardship, I'll be reading from the account of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 to 43. It says here, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a, but a poor widow came and put into a very small copper coins worth only a few cents, calling his disciple to him. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Notice that this poor widow gave all she had left with which to live on. She loved the Lord so much that instead of satisfying her human need, she longed to see the Lord's work progress. Jesus did not, did not try to stop her from giving because she was poor. He knew that, the, that giving brings its own blessing to give to the, to the giver. Even though the amount of money she put in was just a fraction of a cent, she had done better than the critical rich givers who poured in sacks of money to be seen by all. My dear brothers and sisters, as we return God's tithe and give our free will offering today, let us remember that in the sight of heaven, it is not really the size of a gift that counts, but the motive that prompts it. Heaven is interested only in the amount of love and devotion the gift represents, not its monetary value. Our deacons are now, are now ready to serve us.
please stand. Our loving God, our most gracious Father in heaven, we would like to praise you and thank you, Lord, that though we forget you many times, you are not forgetting us to bless us and sustain in our daily lives. Dear Lord, we as your sons and daughters, we are now, retor we are now returning the tithes and offering that belongs to you. May you please continue to bless this, O God, to be used for the finishing of your, of your work in this world. And Lord, continue to bless us also. We ask all of this in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Help 